there. Hey there, hey there. <clears throat> All right, all right. Good morning, everybody. How are you today? Doing well? Okay, awesome. So for those of you who I haven't met, which is a lot of you, uh, my name is Tim, and I'm one of the pastors here at Hope Church. And my wife, Nicole, and I are at the um, SoCal location primarily. We got some, some people ready to go right here in the back. I love that. Um, and, uh, and every now and then I get to come up here and hang out with you guys, and I'm so stoked every time I get to do it because you guys are amazing, there's so much energy. Every time Nicole and I leave here, we're like, man, that was amazing. That was just so good. So you guys, you guys have it good here. And um, um, today we get to jump into the Psalms. We're, uh, we're in this series called Psalms of Ascent. And so we're gonna jump into a Psalm here today. But um, I wanna just, before we get started, um, before we jump right in, I wanted to uh, encourage you here today to listen actively. Um, you know, I was sitting back there in the chair, and I was like, this chair is one of the most comfortable chairs I've ever been in. <laughs> it was so good. I was like, you know, maybe Chad could just get up and talk, because I'm like super comfortable right now. <laughs> I'm chill, I'm enjoying this worship. I got my cup of coffee, which by the way, if you're one of the new faces here and you wanna get connected, want more information and you go fill out a connect card, we will bribe you with a very nice coffee mug, just like this one right here. It says Hope on it, Hope Church. And so if you want a free coffee mug, go get one, all right? Um, but. I was, I was sitting back there and no, I was really, I was excited to jump up here because we believe that every time that we gather together like this, that God has something in store for us. In fact, we believe that God has gone before us, not just in your heart, but in this very room. God has gone before us and has prepared for every single person here something special, something unique, something powerful, something that you need for your heart and soul. He's done that already for you. He's, he's, he's done that. So when we gather like this, man, we are expecting God to move. Like every Sunday when we gather, no matter where we are, Hope SoCal, Hope Scotts Valley, the Coastlands and Aptos, all three churches in our partnership, we're, we can't wait to see what God's going to do because we know that he's ready and he's waiting. And there's this story about Jesus where he goes back to his hometown and um, he's ready. He's locked and loaded. He's ready to go. He's got like he's been healing people, raising people from the dead. He's been feeding people miraculously like he's ready to go. And he comes into his hometown and they can't get over the fact that this was the guy they grew up with. And one of the worst verses in the entire Bible is that chapter where that story is told. The last verse in that chapter is, and Jesus did not many mighty things there because of their unbelief. Like the savior of the world locked and loaded and he literally just turned away and walked on to the next town that was ready for him. And he did some amazing things there. Let us not be those people that walk away from here, and it's said of us, and Jesus did not many mighty things there at Scotts Valley and in their hearts because they just weren't looking for it, they weren't expecting it, and they didn't believe it. That's on the side. That's, that's, just, that's just gravy for you here today. That's just gravy. That's icing on the cake. Um, that's not part of our, of, of our message today, but um, I hope you come into these times expecting God to do something in your heart, because I know I do. And so um, we're going to jump right in. So speaking of jumping in, I had this amazing experience um, um, about two weeks ago. <laughs> Chad knew that would happen. He, he, he saw me put it up there. I could see it in his eyes. And he was like, he was like that's not good, Tim. You, you shouldn't do that. Good thing I wore flip-flops, you know? Yeah, that's right. Sorry, that's good. Um, 
we're all good. Oh, look, there we go, there we go, there we go. See, now we're proper, now we're proper. All right, just a little bit of, you know, I just wanna wake you up, you know? And good thing that coffee wasn't hot on my foot, you know? Then I would have had to like take legal action against the church, it would have been a whole thing. You know, a whole McDonald's thing, it just, it wouldn't have been good. All right. Well, speaking of jumping in, hold on, let me drive, let me, let me drive my foot off here. Uh, so speaking of jumping in, a couple of weeks ago, uh, my family and I were, were, were so fortunate, we were able to take a first ever for us trip to Hawaii. God just sort of worked it out for us, just amazingly, he did this thing, and we went, and we had this trip. And so uh, Nicole and I have three kids. We have a 21-year-old, a 19-year-old, and a 16-year-old. And so all five of us, we went, and we figured out that this was probably going to be like maybe the last summer where all of us are living in the house together. And so we're like, let's, let's, let's do something. Like, let's figure it out. Let's make it happen. And so we did. And so we went to Oahu. Anybody been to Oahu here? Oh, what? Did you see that? Like, like the whole room. Did you take like a, like a Scotts Valley missions trip to Oahu or what? <laughs> what happened there? Wow. Um, I knew I liked you guys. So um, we decided, so the waves are bigger on the South Shore in the summer months, so we decided to stay on the South Shore and stay right in the middle of all the tourist craziness there in Waikiki. And um, the waves were like triple overhead. First, uh, uh, biggest waves in like over 30 years while we were there. It was crazy. We couldn't surf at all the whole time, except for the very last day, we forced ourselves to get out there where we could because we're like, we can't come to Hawaii and not surf, right? And um, so we did all these amazing things. We, we did all the things. We, we did like, like Hawaiian shave ice, right? And I don't eat like processed sugar. And so I'm watching them make this thing and they're pouring the syrup. And it's like, I got a small one. It was like the size of my head. And I was just like, what? And I got the condensed like coconut milk on top as well. And so about two bites in, my body was like, what are you doing? No. And so we had that, man, we had all these, all these things. We did all the things. One of the things that we did though, was we jumped off of cliffs into the ocean. And so my boys and I um, went together and there was this big cliff, uh, Waimea Bay, if, if any of you have been there and you've seen the thing. And um, we did some snorkeling and we jumped off the cliffs, but we had a once in a lifetime experience where all three of us decided to do it at the same time. So check out, check out this evidence, this proof. That's, that's me in the middle. So that was about, that was about um, 30 feet up in the air, and we jumped off this thing. Now, you wouldn't have noticed this. I did, because I've, I've watched the thing about 400 times. But um, both of my boys, their feet were pointed down, right? Because they were like all in. They were, they were just full sand, just, you know, they were all in. Their feet were pointed down. They were like perfect. My feet were pointed up. And I think it was psychologically is because I was like, no, you know, and I had to do it because my boys were there and I'm not going to like have my boys do it and me not do it. And so, you know, 68% of being a dad is doing stuff just because you have to not look bad in front of your boys, right? Your teenage boys. So, but I remember before that group jump, I stepped up for the first time and I knew I was going to go, right? I knew I was going to do it. And so um, we climb up the rock. You have to climb past the signs that say, do not jump off the rocks. Um, so we jump up there and, um, and I remember stepping up to the edge and I didn't want to hesitate because I knew I would suck myself out, right? And um, plus there's like, there's like little kids. There was like a one-year-old who like, you know, jumped off the, no, it wasn't one, but I mean, they were like, so I step up and I have like Jurassic Park size butterflies in my stomach. I'm so afraid. And I step up to the thing and I was like, I got to do it. I, there's just no way I can't. I'm not going to go back down in front of my boys. Nicole's over here filming me, right? So I'm like, I got to do it. So I just step up and I just take the leap and I jump and it was amazing. And we did it, you know, a ton of times and it was just so much fun. 
How many of you, has anyone jumped off of that rock here? Okay, okay, look at these guys. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? We got some guys here who have done it. Can you, can you feel it? Like, oh, yeah. do, you remember, do you remember how it was for you? Um, how many of you know in life, we all have times and experiences where we have to make the leap? We have to take the jump. You know, if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, you've taken the jump. At one point in your life, you were presented with the love of Jesus. And you were confronted with his love and given the opportunity to choose to receive his love. If you're here today and you've never done that, here's a little bit of what it's like. right? You hear of this amazing love of Jesus that the Son of God came that he lived a perfect, sinless life. He became one of us. He became flesh and blood, and he moved into the neighborhood, the Bible says. And he lived a perfect, sinless life. And then when he was 33 years old, right, he was, he was unjustly accused. He was violently beaten. He was put to death in the way of a criminal for doing nothing wrong. And he goes into the grave, and three days later, he's resurrected to life again. And as he is resurrected to life, because he is the perfect son of God, he brings victory over sin and over death and over hell and over all the things that separate us from God. And at one point in your life, you were presented with this love, this invitation to receive his love. And when you did, you took a leap of faith, right? You stepped out and you said, I don't know if this is true. I don't know if this, I, 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 as best as I know how, I'm just doing what I sense is right in the moment. And you took a leap of faith and you jumped into the arms of Jesus. And if you've traveled with him any length of time, you know that he caught you. And in your life, you've experienced his presence and his goodness. You've experienced his mercy and his grace, joy. You have peace where you shouldn't have peace. You have forgiveness that wells up in your heart when you shouldn't have forgiveness towards somebody, right? You've seen the evidence of Jesus in your life. Maybe you've had other things that have happened. We've all taken that leap of faith, those of us who have trusted Jesus. But we've all taken this leap no matter who we are. Um, if you're married here today, you took a leap of faith. As well as you thought you knew that person, you were still taking, the, it was still a risk, right? Like I'm standing before God and all these people committing myself to this person for the rest of my life until death do us part. I'm taking a leap of faith, believing that this is going to be all that I hope and I dream that it's going to be. If you've ever been in a relationship, if you've ever gone to a new school, if you've ever taken a new job, if you've ever been the one at work who volunteered to take a project, lead a project, you, you took a risk, right? And you had to step out. All of us, all throughout our lives, we take these risks. And for some reason, I think for a lot of us, we look at the life of following Jesus, and there's that initial leap of faith where we say, I trust you with the salvation of my soul for eternity. But... And we sort of step back on all the other daily things in our lives. We, like, we get scared. We, we step up to the edge when it comes to, to certain things. And all of a sudden, we get the butterflies in our stomachs like I did right before I, I made that jump. And, all, and, and many of us turn around and we climb back down the rocks because we won't step out. And what I found was that when I made the jump, I not only loved the experience, but I had this great memory with my boys, my, my entire family, in fact, and, and it's something that I'll never forget, and I'm so glad that I did it. And for some of us today, I'm just gonna let you know this right up front, it might get a little uncomfortable. Because the life of following Jesus is not supposed to be lived sitting in the comfortable chair. The life of following, yes, we're comfortable in his presence. We're secure in his presence. But God has designed this life for us to trust him for more. We believe that God wants more for you. And oftentimes, the more comes at a price. It means that you're going to have to take the leap into some things. So today, we're going to look at... Um, 
One of the Psalms, now a couple of few weeks ago, you might remember if you've been here, Pastor Chad, he, um, he, he walked through a portion of the longest Psalm in the book of Psalms and actually the longest chapter in the book, uh, in the Bible. Um, today, we're going to go the opposite direction. We're going to look at the shortest Psalm in the book of Psalms, and we're actually going to look at, this is the shortest chapter in the entire Bible. And some of you are like, yeah. We're getting out of here. We're getting out of here early. Nope. Nope. Sorry. Not going to happen. But what's, what we're going to be able to do today is we're going to be able to linger just a bit. We're going to marinate just a little bit in some of the most foundational truths in the life of following after Jesus. We're going to take our time because this chapter is only two verses long. Now, how many in here uh, are OCD? OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, right? Yeah, some of you. Okay, okay, all right. We got like spouses raising other spouses' hands. Like, yeah. How many of you are o- so OCD that for you, you are uh, what's called OCDO? Like, there's got to be, it starts with O, it's got to end with O, and the four letters balances it out. So it's all like perfectly aligned. You're, you're OCDO. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a group for that, and uh, we, can, we can help you. We can help you today. Um, today, as we walk through this psalm, this psalm is the literal middle of the Bible. It's the exact middle of the Bible, this psalm. And so for you OCDO people, this is it for you. It does not get any better for you than this psalm right here. So we're going to be in Psalm chapter 117. Psalm chapter 117, and we're going to walk through these two verses together. And I'm going to give you the answer to a question, actually a series of questions, right now. And then by the time we're done, I'm going to give you the questions. All right, here's the answer. The answer is always yes. The answer is always yes. And then we're going to talk about what those questions are. So as we jump into these psalms or this psalm here today, I want to bring you up to speed because we're jumping into the middle of a book, right? Not just the middle of the Bible, but a middle of a section in the Bible called the Psalms. And um, if you haven't been hanging out with us during this message series, the Psalms are a collection of actual songs. Like at one time they had music Uh, you know, instrumentation and harmonies and melodies. They were like actual songs that the Jewish people would sing together at various times of the year. Well, we've lost all of that music side of it, but we still have the poems. And at one point, somebody collected all of these poems. And this wasn't just a random collection of poems either. This wasn't just like somebody saying, hey, let's just pull all these things together as a nice remembrance of something. No, this is very intentional, the book of Psalms. So in the first part of the Bible, you have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And if you're not like familiar with the church, all of that I just said, you're like, what is that? So that's called the Torah. The Torah is the first five sections of the Bible. Now in the Torah, uh, we have the law of God. Now how many of you love the word law? Yeah, some of you do. Wow. Okay, I need to get to know you because I don't understand that. Um, uh, Normally, when we think of the law, we think of like the blue lights in our in our in our rearview mirror, right? Like we think of like, oh man, what did I do wrong? What's the you know the law is like the standard of something, and oftentimes we don't perform to that standard, right? And the and the Jewish people knew this very well. They broke God's law every day. And so the law was not necessarily their friend. It was this thing that was just sort of lorded over them, and they knew that they wouldn't measure up to this thing. And so there was this whole system of making it right with God once they broke the law, right? The Psalms were collected and given to the Jewish people as one writing as a way to help process the law. It was a response to the law. It was a way for God to show his people that there was joy and peace and comfort and all of what they needed in spite of the law. The law would condemn us, but God had a better thing in store. And so the Psalms are actually a bridge between the law of God, right, and Jesus. 
And so when we look at the Psalms, that's what we're looking at. And this particular Psalm, you guys are going to love this. If you've been around the church, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're going to love this. This particular Psalm is part of a group of Psalms called the Egyptian Hallel. Now, do you know what word we get from this word Hallel? Anybody? Hallel? Hallel? Yeah. What longer word? What? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It, were, it means praise. This is a series of psalms that are Egyptian praise songs. And you're like, what's that all about? These were sung during the Passover season every year by Jewish people as a remembrance of when God brought them out of slavery in Egypt. So for hundreds of years, they were in slavery in Egypt, and God miraculously brought them out. But the Egyptian people didn't want to let them go. And so God had to do a series of things to get the Egyptian people to let his people go. And the very last one, the last one he had to take, he waited until the very end. He gave them lots and lots of opportunities. And they rejected him over and over and over again. And the very last one, this is kind of gnarly, he sent his angel of death and the firstborn of every household, both human and animal, was put to death that night. However, you could escape the angel of death if, that's a super gnarly, I know, if you, you sacrificed a lamb as part of the, the, the meal that you had, and if you took that blood and sprinkled it on your doorway, the angel of death would pass over your house and not take anyone from inside that house. So every year, the Jewish people would celebrate Passover how God rescued them from uh, e Egyptian slavery. So in this section of Psalms, they would sing the first couple of Psalms before the Passover dinner, and then they would sing the others after the dinner. Now here's why this is important. Jesus, the last supper that he had with his followers was the Passover meal. They would have the Passover meal, and then later that night, Jesus would be betrayed and arrested and eventually, within days, he would be put to death. In the gospel accounts, two of the gospel accounts record that after the Passover meal, Jesus and his followers sung a hymn. This is the song that they would have sung together. And you'll see the significance of that as we walk through these two verses. There's a lot. There's a lot here, you guys. And I'm going to work pretty hard to get through it all. Um, so let's go. Here we go. Psalm 117 and verse 1 says this. Actually, I'm going to read both verses, and then we'll sort of unpack these together. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. All right, so for all of you OCD people, this is a, a great psalm for you as well because it starts with praise the Lord and it ends with praise the Lord, right? That's the way a lot of these psalms were written. There, were, there, there was a balance to it, right? There was a balance to it, and this is no exception. And so let's jump right in here, praise the Lord. Now, this, this word praise, this very first word, means shout for joy, this isn't a praise like, um, like you're, you're, you're sitting like in your comfortable chair with your Bible open. Maybe you're listening to some worship music and you're just sort of calmly um, praising God. Maybe you're singing along with a song or you're just letting something minister like to your heart. Uh, this isn't a calm, casual, chill type of word. This particular praise the Lord is a shout for joy. It's an excitement. It's an energy. It's an enthusiasm. It's, it's what you might, you know, go to a ball game and you see lots of people cheering. Or you come to like, even here in Scotts Valley, you come, you, we worship together and people get excited. You start hearing people like, like shouting things out, you know. We, did, we had that this morning. You have people that start to raise their hands, right? You have people get, like, this is, what, this is what this writer of this psalm is saying. With excitement and enthusiasm, let's engage God in this. So, so, so let's marinate just for a few minutes on this this morning. What do you have to praise the Lord about? Have you ever seen God do something on your behalf? 
Have you, have you ever seen God answer a prayer for you? Have you ever prayed for someone else and seen God answer that prayer? Have you ever had something in your life that was broken and God came in one way or another and healed it, repaired it? If you've said yes to the love of Jesus, do you remember what it was like before you said yes? Do you remember how, it, how you felt lost and something was not quite right and there just was something going on in there that you knew you needed something outside of yourself? And then, in God's divine timing, you were presented with the love of Jesus at just the right time. Right? What do you have to praise God for? Do you have peace in your life? Do you have joy in spite of your circumstances? Um, have, you, have you ever had a sense of the mercy of God in your life? Mercy, not getting what you deserve. How about God's grace in your life? God giving you good things. Your know, mercy is like sitting down at a restaurant and you eat a meal, and they bring you the bill, and you reach back, and you think, oh, no, I forgot my wallet. Oh, I got to go all the way home. You know, my spouse, my date has to stay here, and I got to come all the way back. You know, it's like this big thing. And they say to you, you know what? Don't worry about it. We got you on this. And you're like, what? Like, I, don't, I deserve to have to be inconvenienced to go home and get my stuff and come back, but they give it to me anyway, right? Grace is when you sit down to a meal and you eat the meal and you're ready for the bill and they come to you and they say, you know what? You're such a good customer. Um, we got this. This one's on us. Oh, thank you so much. Like, how many of you have experienced the goodness of God in your life? Have you ever seen somebody healed? I have. Have you ever seen somebody broken of chains in their life? Have you had a, a time in your life where you were bound by something? Did, did you used to have an addiction to porn, and now God's broken that chain, and you see people as God sees them, right? Did you at one time ever harbor unforgiveness in your heart? And there was no way you were forgiving that person for what they did to you. And the Holy Spirit came in. And when the Holy Spirit came in, began to just heal your heart and brought you to the point where at some point you offered forgiveness to someone who had no business getting forgiveness in your heart and mind. Right? We have a lot to praise the Lord for. And not just small stuff. Not just, I got a good parking spot right? Or I walked in and I got a good sale. Oh, thank you, Jesus, the favor of God. I don't know that that's the favor of God, by the way, but not just that stuff, but the big stuff. We have so much to praise the Lord for. And I think for a lot of us, we have just sort of the things we go about doing. And even when we come on a Sunday morning and we gather and we just don't, we, we, we don't think about, we don't stop long enough to think about what do we have to praise God for. I want to challenge you this week to take some time and write down the things that God has done in your life that you are thankful for. Just start writing them down. And when you get to the end of the list, set it down and come back to it another day. And do that for three, four, five days in a row, and you'll be surprised at how much stuff you write down. Praise the Lord. Now watch this. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol, which is another sort of version of praise, it means applaud. So this is like a loud thing. Like we're not like this is not a subtle, chill thing. This praise the Lord, extol him is this active, energized thing. All you nations and all you peoples. Now, here's why this is so important. The writer of this psalm, remember, is writing this to Jewish people. Jewish people believed then and still now believe that the only way to God is through their way through Judaism. You did, God's, God's love and grace and all of that wasn't necessarily for all the other people. 
It was for us. Now, if you want to convert to Judaism, then it's for you. But it's not for all people. And here we are on the night Jesus was betrayed. He knew what he was about ready to do. He was about ready to give his life for the entire world, for Jew and Gentile. And here they are, they're singing this hymn together. Praise the Lord, all you people. This literally means all you nations. Now, the psalmist gives us a reason to praise God if you don't have one already. Watch this. For great is his love toward us. This word great means strong and mighty. The love of God is so strong, so mighty, so powerful in our life that it moves us to enthusiastically praise the Lord. And if you've ever experienced God moving in your life, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I was jacked up before Jesus. Let me just tell you, the love of God is so powerful that it stepped into my mess and brought a miracle. Each one of us could tell the exact same story in our own way. The love of God is strong and mighty toward us. And watch this, the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. This word faithfulness and this word endure has this, has this, this uh, meaning of, of permanent. You know what the psalmist is saying here for us? The love of God is so powerful and it's so permanent that it moves us to praise him. This is what the psalmist is telling us today. In your life, where have you seen the power of God? In your life, do you need to be reminded that the love of God is constant? It's ongoing. It's enduring. Whatever it is you did last night that you would be so ashamed to tell everyone in this group about right now, whatever it is you did last week or last month or last year, the love of God is bigger than that. It will last the test of time. In fact, here's what the Tim Coleman version of this passage would say. The love of God is more powerful, more constant, and more far-reaching than you could ever imagine. And today, I believe that God would have us to simply marinate in this truth. In fact, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians, the message version, his letter to the church in Ephesus says it like this. I ask that with both feet firmly planted on this love that we're talking about, you'll be able to take in with all the followers of Jesus the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. Reach out and experience the breadth. Test its length. Plumb the depths. Rise to the heights. In response, live full lives full in the fullness of God. Listen, God can do anything, you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. And he does it not by pushing us around, this is the law, but by working within us, his spirit deeply and gently within us. This is the love the psalmist is pushing us to. You've been following Jesus for a while? Have you forgotten how wide and long and deep and high is the love of Jesus for you? Strong enough and constant enough and far-reaching to all people. This is the love of God. So on the way home from Hawaii, I'm sitting there and I have an open seat in front of me because at that point in that trip, I was ready to be by myself a little bit, you know what I'm saying? No, I'm just kidding. I had an open seat next to me, and one of my kids, the others are sitting behind me, and I have one on the aisle next to me. One of my kids taps me on the shoulder and says, can I come sit next to you? I was like, absolutely. So they come up, they sit next to me, and um, they're having the beginning of, of a panic attack, um, anxiety on the plane, and, um, and so they say, Kate, would you pray with me? I said, sure. So I prayed. And then I took my phone. 
took my phone and um, I, pulled up, I pulled up the passage in Philippians 4 that says, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in all situations, present your request, your fear, your doubt, your anger, your whatever. Present it all to God in prayer. And in a divine exchange, he will take those things and he will give you his perfect peace. It'll guard your heart and it'll guard your mind because of Jesus. And so I, it all fit on just my one screen. So I put it on her, um, on her uh, tray. I didn't say a word. I just said it there. And um, part of her, her anxiety was because her blood oxygen, she could see it on her watch, had dropped really low. And she was dizzy. And, and she knew something was coming on. And so, um, and so she, um, she was reading it. I didn't say a word. She was reading it. And then um, I was looking out the window praying for her. And I was praying for her because in her life, she has had moments where she felt like she cried out to God and there was no answer. That the love of God was not big enough for her situation. That it wasn't strong enough to meet her need. That it wasn't far reaching enough to reach her. And so I prayed for her in this moment. I was like, God, please, in this moment, I don't know, would you do this? I don't do something. God, would you meet this need? And so about a minute later, she, I feel on my, on my arm, um, she grabs my arm real excitedly, and I look over, and I'm thinking, uh-oh, you know, it's starting. And she's going to have this full-blown panic attack. And she said, Dad, as I was reading this, and I was, as I was praying, I checked my oxygen level, and it was at 100%. And she's like, God, ah, this is amazing. And, and, and so she asked me, do you have your Bible? And I was like, Psh, of course I have my Bible. And so I pull it out, and she starts reading it. And eventually she goes, and she sits back in her own seat, and she was fine the rest of the way. The love of God was strong enough, constant enough, and far-reaching enough to meet her in her place, and it's the same for whatever you're facing in your life. So today, let's respond to that. The band is going to come back up right now, and we're going to have a chance to respond to this love of Jesus. Let's respond to the great love of Jesus today and invite Jesus to step right into where we are, to what our needs are, and ask him to bring his love to meet our need right now. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your love. Thank you for reminding us of this love today. Thank you that in the short psalm that we've covered here today, you've reminded us of the depth and the width and the heights, God, the length of your love. Right now, would you, would you bring that love into our hearts and into our needs? And it's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.